What's up, everybody? Hello and welcome to episode number 94 of the audio podcast with the VK Bros, Jason and Alex on channel. How are you this morning, bruh? It's a bit early in the week. Yeah, it's very early. It's Tuesday, yeah. which is just down to scheduling issues from my end. So yeah. uh, obviously the latest pod only came out yesterday. So we haven't really had a lot of feedback that we can address from that yet. I have had some feedback. I've had though. some. Yeah. So my main bit of feedback was that I wore sleeves last week and that particular viewer was obviously very upset about it. So I put my uniform back on for this week's, <laughs> for this week's pod. But actually, like, I I put a thing. How hot is it at the moment? It's disgusting. What happened? Like a couple of weeks ago, we it, it was like having these massive like cold streaks and then we're like, oh, here comes winter. And it's like 28 degrees today. Like, yeah, it's, it's gross. Ridiculous. And there's guys out there, guys and girls, guys and everything. If you've got mold in your house, yeah. sort it out. The, mm. My place was so sticky and disgusting on Sunday that I was ringing, like I've, I've got a dehumidifier being delivered yeah. like right now. You can't yeah. buy them yeah. at the moment, so you have to look secondhand. And we're borrowing one because mm. uh, uh, this person's got two. But I can feel it. I get into bed yeah. and, and we've, we've found the dry setting for aircon, but I believe... Look, AC experts out there, correct me if I'm wrong. This aircon unit where it's got a physical unit sitting inside here mm-hmm. sucks the air through the top, that top flap, and mm-hmm. then pumps it out through the bottom, right? right? So when I set that one to the dry setting, which it's, it's currently on, that's got more of a chance of sucking in wet air, right? And then having dry air come out. Whereas it, I've got ducted aircon at home, so the unit's outside. So the unit sucks air from, from the outside, outside. Oh. tries to dry it. So I think, I think this is like a twofold increase, right? Because you're sucking in uh, wet air mm. and pumping out dry air, mm-hmm. whereas my home unit is sucking in wet air and only pumping in dry air. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. So it's like recirculating it. Now, I could, I could be completely wrong, but it yeah. is nowhere near as effective as what that unit is here. Right. And mold is no joke. Like Alex has told the story on the pod before about when he moved to Sydney years ago and you had like chronic fatigue and everything. Dude, there are people on there. When I was going through all that and I ended up self-diagnosing myself because the specialists had no idea. Yeah. There are people that have had committed suicide due to, uh, and when they've done uh, autopsies on them after, found mold spores inside their lungs. Yeah. Right. And I can totally see why if you've got no help, if you, and you're all of a sudden allergic to everything mm. and you can't make it past 12 o'clock in the day without falling asleep. Yeah. It's not good. So you've either got mold or kids or both or both. <laughs> but, but I, I cannot stress enough. You need to sort it out. Yeah. And it, it funny story It's amazing how quickly it can, it can grow. Like, uh, we obviously it's been really, really rainy for the last week and a half, two weeks almost. And I worked last, it would have been last Tuesday and then from Wednesday, pretty much onward, uh, there was no work because it was mm. just too rained out. But when I worked on the Tuesday, I, the gloves that I was wearing had gotten really wet. And this was doing like a lot of green waste pickup stuff. So it's like picking up, you know, wet uh, grass clippings mm. and stuff like that. Anyway, I went back to work yesterday, went and jumped in the truck that's been sitting for a week. And there was that much mold that had grown on those gloves in a week. They yeah. looked like werewolf hands. Yes, yeah, There was like fur. Come, I'd throw them out. I'm like, I don't want anything to do with mold. Dude, uh, my broomstick. So inside the shed, mm. I've got a broom that's that's a uh, brand new broom. It's yep. hard up against the, the shed wall. Yeah. Covered in mold. Yeah, right. And so the offices <clears> have been <throat> fine because I've had these these um, dryers on yeah, uh, yeah. for quite a lot. And, and this is like an insulated part. But yeah. But out in the shed, you could feel how dense the air is. Mm. So every day when I come in, I, I have the shed door right open. I've got mm-hmm. all the back doors uh, open to try and manage it. Yeah. But my house, for some reason, or my, my apartment, I don't know if it's because it's a bit elevated and the mm. fog just seems to, to sit in there. Yeah, yeah. It's rough, dude. And, and I know, like, I can feel it. You get into bed mm. and you know it's just not completely dry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've been taking vitamin D, like supplementing vitamin D while it's been... Mm-hmm overcast yeah and obviously look we're leading we're leading into winter there's already a stack of non-covid flu-like illnesses going around at the Mm. moment i mean daycare has just been sending notification after notification going like you know just because they don't test positive for covid doesn't mean you can drop your sick kids off um which 
I find kind of really frustrating about daycare. Daycare to me is one of the most frustrating businesses on the planet. It's the only business that I know of, and correct me, you might be able to think of another one. It's the only business that I know of that is allowed to tell you that you can't use their services, but you still have to pay for it. So yeah. like hold your spot. Yeah. And this was never more apparent than last month. And every parent who sends their kids to daycare will know what I'm talking about. You had three straight public holidays on a Monday where they ain't paying anyone and you still had to pay for those days. Yeah, it doesn't and not like only it. do you have to pay for those days, but the childcare subsidy from the government pays for whatever percentage you're on for those days too. Sounds like it doesn't need government funding. That's what it sounds like to me. Mm, yeah, mm. well, yeah. That uh, Look, it's just like anything, as we've mentioned before, with government funding, it could definitely be cleaned up a hell of a lot. I suppose that's what we can talk about <clears> today. <throat> did you see... Uh, did you see the Liberal Party's plan for housing affordability? This the morning? superannuation? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so just so people know, Libs want to give first home buyers the ability to access up to fifty thousand dollars of their superannuation mm -hmm. to buy a house. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> for for a start, uh, what sort, what way do you think, what sort of pressure do you think does this put on uh, housing prices when all of a sudden you unlock a Fifty thousand dollars extra capital that people can put towards purchasing a home. Well, you've just answered Do it. Do the prices go up or down? Do they go up by fifty thousand dollars? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Number two, the people that struggle the most to get into the housing market are young people mm. who have no super. I think there was a stat that if you started work when you're eighteen, and you, oh, I can't remember what it was. It, it basically said you had to be in a workforce for ten years to be able to have enough super. Yeah. To to a actually get it. Yeah, and look. Uh, this is one of the interesting things about when we were speaking about different parties last week and we spoke about the Liberal Democrats, their stance on superannuation is it shouldn't be mandatory, it should be voluntary. Mm. Some people will be like, you know what, I'm not good at saving money, I don't want to learn about investing. So having that percentage of my income go Passively into super, invested, yeah. it, it guarantees me a retirement e nest egg. Other people will be like, well, hey, I just want to buy my house now. That's going to be my nest egg because I'm going to buy that thing and then it's going to go up in value and I can sell it down the track or whatever. Mm. Or I want to invest it or I want to buy Bitcoins or whatever. Like maybe it should be a uh, non-mandatory thing. It's funny you bring that up. That's come out naturally because <laughs> it was only a thought that I was having this morning because mm. they're talking about upping the... Um, or I don't know if it's already changed, but they're talking about making a super contribution 12.5%. Yeah. Now, I, you know me, I'm the investing guy. I'm absolutely pro-investing, whether it be passive, mm -hmm. whether, whether it be active. Yeah. I'm so pro. But mandating, like, where does it stop? It, obviously, so, so yeah. we are on this trend where we started at, I think, 7% was the first figure. Right. Now we're talking 12.5%. So yeah. is, is the trend that we're going to keep going until everything's invested? And here's, and here's the thing too. I understand it if you're trying to drive investment to power the economy. But again, as discussed last week, what the UAP talks about all the time, Australian superannuation companies have a trillion dollars in assets invested Outside. overseas. Yeah. So if you're increasing the superannuation percentage and all that money is being sent overseas, you're in a way disadvantaging the, the people who don't want to have that increase because you, you're literally taking an extra 3% out of mm. their day-to-day -day spending money, which then that money doesn't flow through the economy either because it's being sent overseas. Yeah. So it, yeah. So I, I don't <laughs> think, I think it needs to go down. I think the, the, the contribution should be mandatory. So if you want to co-contribute and yeah. maybe there's some tax benefits uh, if you want to co contribute to it. But I don't think making it mandatory, like it makes it hard. You, you could you could do it as like, I mean, everything has got like, you know, if you if you have an investment portfolio or even your super, you log into your super and you'll have the different options you can do for investing, whether it's a growth option, which is more high risk, high reward, or whether it's a safety option, which is they invest in low risk stuff, doesn't give you the same yield, but you're less likely to lose money. You could do something like that in in that you could go, okay, the minimum super contribution from yourself is 6%, the maximum is 12.5%, but you can opt in what percentage amount, you let your payroll know it work, and they can do that. I, I, look, I don't think people are active enough to even go that far, mm -hmm. but I also, what you need to take in consideration from a business point of view is, when you now have up that to twelve and a half percent, if someone now gets paid twenty dollars an hour, but that business has to put aside 
what's that? Two dollars twenty on top of that just for your superannuation, that cost to that business is now twenty two plus payroll tax plus yeah. entitlements plus okay, so in, in a way it's a pay rise. Yeah. Okay, so effectively it's a pay rise. Now if you've got the the if you've got like the Labor government talking about upping minimum wage, there's a pay rise and now the twelve and a half percent is in like yes. has to be factored into that yeah, as well. Yeah. So think about a, bi- a business just going, well, hold on, what am I going to do with this? Yeah. I'm going to have to charge more. That's right. And because any, I don't get that money. Now a, a on, government mandate that 12.5% yeah. goes to yeah. a superannuation fund. And for anyone who's on minimum wage, who's going, yeah, well, you know, the cost of living is going through the roof. So we do, we do need a, a, a pay increase. Yeah, I get it. The businesses that you work for have, have been experiencing the same uh, pressures on their business. So like, I understand that. Like, The problem is with when it comes down to business, in my perception, particularly minimum wage workers, but also, again, I guess this is like more of a labor type or a left-wing ideology perspective and people who subscribe to that, is they look at business as evil. They, yeah. look, at, look, they look at the workers who are on minimum wage, that they, they treat them like this... Um, like an abused partner yeah. and the business is the evil corporation who doesn't care about you and you're just a number and they're just trying to extract as much out of you as they can possibly get for the cheapest they possibly can and that's why they don't want to increase the minimum wage. Guys, you got to understand, like small business drives this country. It always has. Mm. It is the lifeblood of this country. If you increase these costs overall, most small businesses will have to make a choice between hiring as many staff so people will probably end up losing jobs and yeah. you, you see this with like um penalty rates on weekends like there's a lot of people going oh i i i did that um that compass thing that you can do to see you know, oh which way you vote like yeah. which way you should vote which is annoying because when i did it i was like oh this just tells you which of the three majors you should vote for right and i think that that's just half a propaganda tool in itself yeah right to make it seem like, oh, you shouldn't vote for any of those other yeah. options. Um, but I did that. And one of the things like they spoke about was like, you know, do you support a rise in minimum wage? And the, this is one of those things that I think I mentioned. Well, stick, stick to it. What did it say? Oh, it just, it just asked, do you support it or not? Yeah. And then obviously if you support it, then you're more of a Labor Greens voter. And if you don't, then you're more of a Liberal voter. What did, what did your, when you spun the wheel, what did it come out and tell you? Mine said that I was predominantly a liberal supporter, but it was still only, I still only supported like 57%. Yeah. And when, one thing that annoyed me about it as well is a lot of the questions are worded in a way that I had to give a neutral answer because they weren't really clear. So to give an example, one of the questions is, do you support an increase in government funding to universities? And like, there's like five different options and it's like strongly disagree to strongly agree. And it's like, well, what's the support based on? Because in my head, I go, I support government funding of university degrees for Australian for citizens. Yeah. I don't support governments just giving universities money for what, like what research grant. I mean, you, you would have seen all the stuff I've sent you for, for ages about wastage when it comes to research grants, at least in the United States, I see so many of them. Like some of these universities in America were given grants to see what effect cocaine had on pigeons. Like, no, I don't support an increase in that funding. Sure. But if we're going to be uh, taxpayer funding Australian citizens to go through university and get higher education, I'm okay with that. So I had to give a neutral answer. Right. Um, but so- I think that's a distillate of what the whole... Everyone I've spoken to about politics, because that's what I try and do. I go to parties and I bring up politics, yeah. uh, COVID response. Everyone loves that guy. Yeah, straight away, <laughs> yeah. cut straight through it, and then start recruiting new users to Bitcoin. Yeah. And what a lot of people have brought up is that someone in the family, mem- uh, someone in their family circle, is one policy is enough to switch people off yeah. them. I've, I've got an example of that too. I heard on the weekend. There's a lot of that. Yeah. Which to me seems <clears throat> wild because. You should, like, is that is that what our society has become? Is like, we're so passionate against one thing that we're against as opposed to the majority that we are pro. Mm. And a lot of people don't know, and as we said last week, a lot of people don't know what the what their projects are or what their um, policies are mm. because it's not advertised. That's right. We don't look at it. Uh, 
Okay, I listened to a really interesting podcast yesterday, which is about a completely unrelated subject, which is so relevant to this conversation. The podcast was by, it was the Huberman Lab podcast mm-hmm. by Dr. Andrew Huberman, and it was about aggression and how aggression really works and how you can control it or even how you can ramp it up if needed. Because obviously some people are super over-aggressive, some people are probably under-aggressive mm. and there's, there's negative effects either way. And what he explained, which is quite interesting, is that aggression is not necessarily a personality trait, although some personalities are more uh, leaned towards being aggressive, but it's actually a neural pathway. And this was, I mean, there's all these experiments done way back in the day, but one of the experiments that they were doing on, on rats was about stimulating a certain part of the brain which stimulated this pathway. And you could literally switch aggression not only on, but if you then took away that stimulation, like using neurons or whatever, as soon as you took that stimulation away, it would switch it straight off. And I feel... It was one smish motion and then one blowjobs? Uh, no, well, well, for rats. Well, funnily enough, um, the one of the tests they did was they... So they connected these electrodes to a certain part of the brain which stimulates this neural pathway. And they put a... So in a male rat. And they put it in with a female rat. And they... The female rat had to be this certain type. Like, they don't have like a similar... Blonde. <laughs> yeah. No, but they don't have the same sort of menstrual cycle as a as a human female does. But so they've not got, on the rack. Well, they've got certain times of the month where they're receptive and certain times where they're not. So yeah, that's a that's a much like human. Yeah, similar but different cycles. Anyway, stop interrupting me. So they put a uh, and look, male rats they want to mate all the time. Mm. It's whether or not the female's receptive. <laughs> Again, the same as humans, pretty much. Uh, but. They put the rat in, the female's in a receptive state, and the male was trying to mate with the female and would start mating. Then they would stimulate these electrodes to switch on the aggression thing. Immediately, the male rat stops trying to procreate and attacks the female, like trying to kill the female. Wow. Immediately. Immediately. That's the the difference. And then as soon as they took that stimulation away, completely dropped the aggression and went back to trying to mate with the female. So it just shows you that it's this neural pathway. It's not necessarily like we think of it as an emotion and it is an emotion that you feel, but how you get to that feeling is a neural pathway. Now, let me finish the point. One of the things I think is so relevant about the current state of society and your point about politics with people being switched off by one policy I feel like over years, especially of social media use, that neural pathway to just go straight to anger, straight to outrage, has become so strong in so many people. They hear one thing they don't like, and it's usually told to them by someone who would benefit from Mm. you not liking that particular thing. They go straight to anger and outrage, and they rule that thing straight out, and they move on. So it's got nothing to do with social media. So that, uh, that I've done a course on that talked about neural pathways right and it's part of the amygdala amygdala which is amygdala couldn't say amygdala Mm -hmm. which is the fight or flight response and that neural pathway is the one that is fired off when you hear something that you don't like because if you didn't like something in the past you needed to fight or fly to Mm -hmm. survive yep it's so been that's around got forever. To do with social media. Exactly. So social media has nothing to do with like this is there's not stop, there's not more or less of this attitude. It's been built into us for ever. For sure. Now, we know for a fact that like marketing campaigns have have played on this mm-hmm. ever since there was marketing yep. because it's it's like the sex sells thing, mm-hmm. you know. It, it we know that outrage sells. Mm-hmm. It always has sold. It's mm-hmm. got nothing to do with social media. Social media may seem like it exacerbates it because we can see more of it, but it, it's not because of social media. So he, no, I'm not saying it's because I'm saying social media has made it a million times worse. It and here's, no, no, here's why you're, you're right. Back in the past, it was, that was designed as a safety tool to fight or flight mode, kick in. If you've got some sort of danger, you weren't encountering danger all day, every day. Now people who for the last two years have been stuck inside their houses on their devices or watching TV are bombarded with danger all day, every day. 
which it strengthens that neural pathway. So in other words, like when someone's trying to uh, like quit smoking, for example, one of the things they often talk about with smoking is it's not necessarily the smoke, it's it's the habit mm. of, and, and you, it's really, really difficult to try to break that habit because it is a neural pathway that has been strengthened and strengthened mm. and strengthened over a long period of time of repeated uh, movements and results. That is what happens with social media. People literally wake up now, they roll over, they grab their phone, they go on social media, something is put in front of them that fires off their amygdala, using the old school tool, like you said, it's it's being abused by social media for engagement, yeah, which we know about. And I feel like that's made that sentiment way worse, which See, is why it's really difficult to have a rational conversation with people about things now. Again, I'm not, I'm not I think that in a pre social media world, you're still having that, but on smaller microcosms, i.e. the person you speak to at the pub, your work colleagues, the newspaper, there was ways to get that stuff fired off that mm -hmm. neural pathway to be built. Yep. I agree with you. Look, it, it, it would have had a set, but it's not, it's not. Uh, so let me, let me give you another example. So you started going to the gym consistently just over a year ago. One of the things that makes people uh, have such huge leaps and bounds of progress at the beginning of going to the gym is that, especially when it comes to like lifting weights, the strength is already there. It's just that all of your neurons fire at different times when it comes to switching on your muscle fibers. And when you get that mind-muscle connection going through repeated movements and repeated use, instead of actually physically getting stronger, you literally just, the signals are going to your muscles in, in unison all at the same time. So your whole muscle is, is actually firing at the same time to be able to lift more weight. And that's through repetition. I and get it. That, I yeah, get it. Which is exactly the same thing as what's happening here. Polarization. Yeah. It has been around as long as humans have. I, I understand that, but it's not, been, it's never been more frequent than it is now. There's what metric are you using for that? I think the, the only difference now is <laughs> the only difference now. Put it in the comments, guys. What do you think? Do you think social media has made outrage a far more frequent thing in people's lives every single day? Of course it has. But for the same, there's still a mass of people that aren't outraged by social media. So there's, so there's, I, I would argue that the percentage of people that are outraged mm -hmm. are always going to be outraged because of that neural pathway thing. Their, their neural pathways are probably developed more so. But there's been extremism and there's been, there has been a, a um, difference in ideas as long as humans have been around. I there understand has been mass, a difference in ideas. Yeah. I, I, I do, what I don't, I'll tell you what I don't cop. Yeah. I do not cop that social media is the reason for humanity's downfall. That's what I do not I'm cop. I'm not saying it's the reason for humanity's downfall. I'm saying it, it, it makes perfect sense that it is strengthening the neural pathway that is switching people from being calm and placid directly to outrage like that. And what I'm because saying is that those people, yeah, I get it. And what I'm saying is that those people that are susceptible to that on social media would have been in, in, a, in a past life would have been susceptible at any other excuse to be outraged. Yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with well, that. Well, you need to you need to find some data to, to, to support. Well, it. you need to find some data to support your your side yeah, as well. Yeah, society is still I mean, still around. Okay, There's well, let's look at let's look at kids and let's look at things like self harm and suicide, which has gone through the roof, and everyone blames social media for that. And because, I don't necessarily think that's, a, that's because with things like bullying, which. Everyone talks about it, bullying in kids in that everyone, bullying's been around forever too, mm -hmm. right? Since humans have been around, bullying's been around. But when kids used to go home from school and were at home, they had a break. Now kids don't have that break. Everyone talks about this because they get bullied online too. And now we've had an increase in self-harm and suicide for many years ever since social media's come out. That's the same thing. It is just repeated dosages well, which no, strengthen that's that a, neural pathway. No, that's a different so no so i agree with you the social media has had a, a, an effect on on that I, I agree with that but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about whether it's a polarizing or or um radicalizing thing that's that's two different things Do you, you can't think the world is more polarized today than it was in say 2020 oh sorry uh 2001 when the war in iraq started do you think that no i, 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 I can cite a different example today? There have been effectively civil wars in Western developed countries in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. before social media was a thing. 
And that was like the... Yeah, but wars always existed. No, no, but civil wars. Civil wars in mm-hmm. Western democracies. We have not had civil wars, but we're talking about like uh, the, the, the Battle of um, LA. That was an abs... Like that was probably the most recent civil war within a Western democracy. Pre... And that was before... And that was... That was Americans killing each other. Mm-hmm. That's 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 what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that it's always existed in our in our psyche. It, that 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 amygdala is a is a million year old mm-hmm. function. Mm-hmm. The neural pathways there. Yes, some people have been more, but I think those people, if social media didn't exist, would still be susceptible to the same sort of outrage because it's it's what they are looking for. It's what it's it's how you help some people see the world. I think I think look. There's parts of what you're saying I agree with. There are there have always been people around who probably through a having a, a lower fear tolerance or stress tolerance have been more highly susceptible to having an overreaction to things. No, it's the other way around. High fear tolerance. If you tolerate fear, then you were less susceptible to being outraged. That's not if the you, opposite. Well, that's exactly what I just said. I know. So if you don't, if you have a high fear tolerance. Mm-hmm then you tolerate more fear, therefore that's, you're not radicalised. Dude, that's just what I said. Yeah. Why are you trying to correct me on the no, no. exact point well, Can I you let made? me finish it? Can you can actually let me finish it? So you just said people with high fear tolerance are the ones that are, that, that are susceptible to... No, being no, it's not. You weren't fucking listening. I would literally said the exact same yeah, thing that you you're just berating so you me for right now. Say it. I said that throughout time, there has always been people who are more susceptible to fear or being scared and therefore would have a higher propensity towards being outraged but you use the term high fear tolerance didn't you yeah i did so which is so which is exactly no 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 you roll back the tape roll back the tape and yeah. you can fucking listen to it what do you want to bet huh what do you want to bet i'm not i'm not betting yeah anything yeah else. i wouldn't bet either okay anyway <laughs> All right, we're on the same page with this. Correct. Let's move on. I was just correcting you because so what you're saying, saying would have led people down the wrong path. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll see. Anyway, so what, what I'm saying is those people have been around forever. Mark the time. So the time is 27 minutes. <clears throat> yeah. Those people have been around forever, mm-hmm. but I would say on average, the average has increased of people that are more outraged now post-social media than there were pre-social media. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree. And, and, and right. I've used well, I've used look, a civil war as a as an. Well, we'll have to example. revisit this. We'll have to we'll have to come back and see. We'll find some data. stats on it because, yeah, yeah I, I think and it would be. Hard. I mean, suppose how do we define it? That's that's the hard thing. How do you define a polarized nation? What metrics would you use to define a polarized nation? Because I thought killing each other would be one. For yeah, sure. for sure. But I think that if you're going back to like the you know 1950s, 1960s, or whatever, and talking about killing each other. I mean, human beings are always going to fight. It's just, it's just part. Of, it's in our nature. It's why we watch prize fighting on the weekend mm. for a start, right? To to be able to experience that vicariously. But I think a lot of the reason why there was all, there was a lot of civil conflicts, even that, that way back then, was just a sheer thing of access. Those other people didn't exist, as far as you were concerned, because you didn't see them in every single day, everyday life. You didn't have the internet to look at things overseas there wasn't a lot of international tv programming back yeah. then you were just going to fight the people that were in front of you or the group that you thought exactly you that in front of you that's what i'm saying is that it, it has always been an inbuilt to people that are people people going to fight they're going to fight mm-hmm. whether social media exists or not they're going to fight yeah i just think that the average of people who will get outraged has increased since social mm-hmm. media because you're repetitively working a neural pathway that that brings you towards the outrage my also another counter argument to that is that social media when used correctly can be the complete opposite of that you know and and i used myself an example when i learned to get off the negative tweet uh, like the negative teat of social media have mm-hmm. i get a lot of good out of it I, I have a lot more information now that i've had before mm-hmm. i know not to partake in that in that conversation and mm-hmm. like you've got to think about the percentage of people that are arguing it's really the one percent on each side screaming at each other in the comments mm-hmm. but i don't partake in that so it's irrelevant to me and there's a lot of people that like the amount of what's the dopamine release that i'm getting from watching the the puppy videos do you know what i mean like mm-hmm. there's that's where there is a there is a counter argument that can be said that it brings a lot of good at the same time. For sure, and I'm, I guess I'm not necessarily talking about the one percent that's arguing on social media, but I am talking about like we know the algorithms are based around engagement and that fear sells, like you said before. Mm. So the more they put that fear stuff in front of you, the more engagement they get on their platforms. 
So whether you engage in the comments or not is one thing, mm. but whether or not that negativity and fear is influencing you is a whole nother thing. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of people, it is influencing. A lot of people actively know that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't realise yeah, how much that. they're being influenced by that negativity. I've got a mate doing it now. Day. I've got a mate doing it now. I've, I've, said it to him, I've said it to him 20 times now. Mm. Don't engage in the comments. Yeah. Don't engage in the comments. And he, I just fired up Facebook before, and there he is again. And look, yeah. he might be thinking that he's, he's adding value, but you're not. Yeah. That, there is no value to be added. That's in. why I stopped doing the COVID debates. What's the point? Like, well, face to face, I think is very powerful. Face off for sure, but on, yeah. on like, I just had one this morning. It was great. <laughs> and then we got Russia, Ukraine. That was great too. Oh, and then we got into politics, dude. <laughs> like, all I had to do was start talking blockchain. After that, yeah. and then absolute Yahtzee. Connect four. Um, let me. Oh, I was gonna say, like, do you actually know this person, or is yeah, 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 goes to the gym. Does he own any crypto? No, didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though. Like, I'm in, I'm in a um. You know, I'm in a bubble. We're all in bubbles. Yeah, yeah. We're all in sure. bubbles. And I'm, I had the conversation with another crypto nut. Mm-hmm. Us crypto guys got into crypto because of a lack of trust of systems that were currently yeah, yeah. in place. So therefore, if you're not a crypto user, you, you, you have trust a trust centralized system more than what a, yeah. I'm not saying you totally do, but I'm saying you do more so yeah, because you, you've you done nothing about, That's yeah, right. because you've done nothing about mitigating yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I do find... I, I totally recognise I'm in a bubble. Yeah, yeah. But a small part of me enjoys the conflict face-to-face mm. where you can see a reaction, where you can have... And we're still mates. We have a mm. laugh about it, yeah. you know? And we... Like, it's... In in a way, that aspect of divide has brought us together. Right. Because we can go... He Like, he walked into here mm. to have the conversation. Yeah, right. That's cool. I love yeah, that. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, and, and whereas that doesn't happen on on social media on for social. sure. And I think what we just did is probably a really good example for people. We just have a disagreement about something. It we raised our voices. It will be proven that I'm right. Yeah, we'll see. And then we've but we've moved on though. Yeah. Right. And you can do that in everyday life. One of the things that has been. Oh, can we talk about our bet? Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that has been. Uh, really sad for me to watch is how many people in the last two years have cut out friends from their lives have Mm. cut out family members from their lives and when you really analyze it it's just because they took the same information and made a different decision yeah and that's Uh, really sad i no i wouldn't say it's that because I, i i would say that there's people i would say the people that have seen the least amount of information are probably the ones that have made the most drastic moves within their mm. network because they've only dabbled in that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like to think that we've been pretty level. We've looked at very pro, like obviously we're talking about the Corona debate mm. and we have followed pro vax people, scientists to try yeah. doctors to try and get there. Well, Dr. John, John Campbell's the biggest one. I started watching him six months before he started coming around yeah because he was so pro-vax yeah yeah and i I wanted to see that perspective but there's no way there's no way that anyone that has had a balanced view Mm. or or, or at least a balanced look not even balanced look sorry i'm trying to say that has balanced their research would have cut family members out yeah and and again that that was psychological programming by the centralized system sure the centralized system told you that anyone who didn't agree with the narrative was a right-wing extremist yep. they told you not to do your own research because doing your own research mm. is a right-wing nazi extremist thing to do which is the example of when this happened before pre-social media so that that, mm. that stuff is like I said, that stuff has happened before. Radicalization yeah. is not new. Oh no, I'm not not claiming it is. Yeah. I just feel like on a day to day basis, and again, I don't even, I don't even think it's radicalization anymore because radicalization used to be based around a cause, and I, like like the COVID thing mm. is radicalization, but I feel like there are there is a certain percentage of people now who are on that up like upper end of the. Uh, susceptibility scale who are now just go straight to outrage but literally about everything and it's it can be it's can even be conflicting things as well but they just go straight to it okay so did you see breaking points where they referenced louis ck and 
Um, Shangulus. Shangulus. Yeah, Did yeah. you watch that one? I the the that breaking clip? points or the breaking points. I listened to it. I didn't. Watch okay. It. He explains it really, really well. Right. Now, I watched that whole... I, I recommend anyone... I think I've mentioned it here before. There's a four-part series where Shane Gillis and Louis C.K. start at the first president of the United States yeah. and, and just have a conversation about the whole thing. I think yeah. they're two or three hours each, and there's four of them. Right. Shane wanted to have one of them on Patreon, and Louis C.K. said, nah. He's like, I want, it, I want everyone to be able to hear it. Mm. I, I don't want any paywall. I'll pay. Yeah, That's right. how cool it is. Yeah. But Louis says something really good when he compares the political landscape of the left and the right in America. Mm -hmm. And he said, the right, I might butcher this, the right says, the right tries to find something that you agree with and say, I feel about, I feel the same way that you do. Even though you might be on the left, I feel the same thing and I'm going to do what I can the way that I that I want to mm -hmm. about that particular issue. I right. believe that issue exists. Yeah. Whereas the left at the moment goes, um, uh, uh, like, what do you believe in? And then and you say it and they're like, what do you mean? That's not the issue. This is the issue. Right. And then the left is pushing more people to the right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As opposed to the right saying, well, okay, we might differ on, uh, some other opinions, mm. but here's something that we do agree on. Yeah. And just, I guess to, to throw out the caveat. These are these are people who lean left and right. We're not necessarily talking about the extremes that are just going to yell and scream over everything. Yeah, correct. Right. It's it's the it's the ones that can have a conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, the, yeah. it's the average that's just erring one way or the other. Yeah. And he, he used an example. He's like, oh, like what about gay marriage? He's like, what do you mean gay? The left's like, what do you mean gay? Yeah, yeah. You know, like it's it's. I I that's not. I don't feel like there's as much of that in Australian uh, politics. Mm. Not the, yet. I wanted. Not the, yet. I had an interesting point though. You did say, I I reckon in some ways, you fall for the media. Not. I don't want to say narrative, but I want to say hot topics. The fact that you removed the term radicalization from this this debate falls into with what the media wanted radicalization to be. Whereas if you looked Explain. at the so. The term radicalization mm -hmm. has been around forever. Yep. And anyone could be radicalized on any particular topic. If you are so warped in your beliefs, you would be radicalized. Okay? Mm. But the media made it a thing during te the terrorist uh, the war on terror. Mm. You're radical uh, radicalized Islamic terrorist. Mm -hmm. When you dismiss the term radicalized for this argument, you've validated the weaponization of that word when it was used for terrorism. You might be right, because to me, it, it came down to my perception of the word. So when I think of radicals... They've recreated I think, it. I think it's like... So when, yeah, radicals for me in the in like the COVID era is the radicalized people on both the pro and the anti sure. side. Yep. But what the reason why I tried to remove the term is because I feel like there is people that have let's say maybe are members of one of those radicalized groups, but then become extremely overly emotionally engaged on every subject, whether it's vaccines, Ukraine, Johnny Depp, Amber Heard, yeah. Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. They're radicalized in their ideology. But, but then if a lot of the times that ideology is, uh, it's, it differs depending on different, there, there might be different situations with the same themes, but they could be on both sides of it, just depending on, on how they're told to feel during the time. But the term, the term <laughs> radicalized means yeah. you're so extreme on one side that it's probably very Let's hard. Look up yeah, the look, actual look, definition. Look up the definition. And whether the whether that has been around pre um, terrorists, there have been words that were made like uh, conspiracy theory yeah, yeah. was created by the CIA, right? To discount some some uh, like counter thought yeah yeah and i mean look we, we 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 talk about all the time on this pod how important language is mm. and how i mean we literally changed the definition of vaccine during the pandemic to suit the mrna vaccines yeah. that Go came get out. your jab yeah uh so radicalized to make radical or more radical see radical in my first thing was ninja turtles yeah, 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 yeah. True. It used to be a good thing. Yeah. 
uh, radicalised, make more radical in social or political outlook. Uh, yeah. In, 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 yeah, okay. Yeah, so, maybe, so that's yeah, what I'm saying. Right. So the like term... Perception of the word. Yeah, yeah. And where I think you fell for it is media decided that that term should be associated with Islamic terrorism. Where, whereas you could be radical, you could be a radicalized plant fiend, mm. right? Where you, you you're just so pro plant that no one can tell you anything else. I guess, you should be able yeah. to use that terminology. In, in my head, I don't I don't think of it just towards like a, as a terrorism perspective. I guess in my head, I go a radical is someone who is so invested in one particular ideology and subject that that is their whole world. They'll even they'll block out everything else, yeah. and they're just invested in that one particular thing, whether it's veganism or yep. a religion yep. or that that in my head was where the term radical was and you might be right maybe but it I is right take one step so you <laughs> said it but take one step out like you went you went deep you said um you said subject or or um oh you said subject remove subject and it's a way of thinking you could have a radicalized way of thinking and that radicalized way of thinking which i i think you'd agree with is what I hear on the TV mm. is the truth. Yeah, and anything guess, counter to that is crazy. Yeah, that's like, a radical thought. That's a radical ideology. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, but I guess in my head, I, I was splitting people into groups of, because that's what we do these days. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. In the, in the interest of being inclusive, we literally label everyone a different group. Yeah. Uh, in my head, I got, so that was my definition of radical or radicalized person. And then on the other hand, the other people I was speaking about are just, the easily triggered people and they're triggered by everything every different situation they're triggered and emotionally engaged in that subject whether it actually affects them or not and what i find really interesting about that and this sort of brings us back to the original point that you said 30, 20 minutes ago about how people discount one political party because of one policy they've heard of um being being one of these people that gets so easily triggered it also makes you so easily manipulated absolutely and, absolutely <clears throat> and like so the example that i'll give is i was having a conversation with someone during the week about uh political parties and they mentioned bob catter and they're the like cat. I, and look bob catter is an interesting cat and they're like oh, i never vote for for bob catter don't want him anything to do with it because he wants to give 11 year old kids guns right and that was their perception so, okay okay i get it i understand why it's a polarizing thing for you what are his other policies who knows? No idea. No one's no one's got any idea. Who, who what what's his political party? I don't even know what it is. It's it's him, it's Cato or whatever. Oh, okay, okay. Um So he's not federal, he's a state senator. I think he is federal. Oh, Maybe not. We didn't research. Know. Honestly, Sorry, again, we didn't I haven't researched him, but I just thought it was a really good example. Because um he we, obviously I just want to get this out because I remembered what I was gonna say about this before. Um so that's an example of they had one policy that they really didn't agree with. They didn't like it. So they've completely ruled them out. So instead of that, it, it actually stops you from even taking the step to go and research yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. Now, when you think about it, given 11 year old kids in Australia, let's say that he got it. He got a seat and he got elected. It's never going to pass. Yeah. Right. You're never going to get the amount of support that you need for that policy for it to pass. So that should be a non-issue, but it's the only issue for someone that's allowed yeah. them to rule it out. It's, it's an example of when, feelings mm -hmm. are weighted more heavily than logic yeah yeah so your feeling is i don't want 11 year olds to have guns mm -hmm. logic will say well that's not going to get through well what else has he got yeah and i feel like this is one of the biggest problems with our easily triggered society now is that it's designed to be a feeling based decision making process rather than a fact based sure. decision making process. And that's why we did the podcast that we did. And it was two hours and twenty minutes and it was, it was yeah. I, I, I want any, anyone, especially before when's the election? Next week. Yeah, you know, it's this it's this weekend. So I mean this will drop on Monday. It's already happened. So Congratulations to the <laughs> <laughs> Um yeah, so it's 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 really interesting, and I feel like. Um, but the, well, sorry, the other point I was going to make is that the biggest problem about all this stuff is that we have completely attempted to, and I don't know if again we haven't done this uh, willingly as a society, but someone who builds narratives has removed nuance from every subject. 
spot and, on. Yeah. yeah, and to give an example, is this Bob Catter policy of you know wanting to not arm eleven year old children, but teach like from eleven years old teach them how to use guns? And obviously that triggers a lot of people, right? Uh, gun control, they see gun violence in America, they see it's a really, really bad thing. And you go, okay, I, I understand. Oh, part of the policy too was that it was only boys, no girls. <laughs> right? Okay. Which can be particularly polarizing in 2022. Gays. Well, and gays will have guns. Gays with guns. I, I, I would assume so as long as... LGBTIQ 9mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, you go, okay, I can see how that would polarize people. Lock, cock, and two smoking barrels. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you go, okay, the same people who'd be polarized by that policy probably also stand for Ukraine at the moment. And in Ukraine, they're in a situation where, I mean, I don't think anyone really saw, or any person sitting in a cushy Western country, I don't think anyone saw Russia invading Ukraine this year. I don't think, I mean, we didn't call it. Right? We, yeah. we said it's all posturing and it wouldn't happen. And it's all well and good to go, oh, well, kids shouldn't know how to use guns because guns are dangerous. But one day, potentially, we could get invaded. And then if it's like Ukraine, where they go, women and children can leave the country, any men between the ages of 18 and 50 or whatever the age group is, has to stay and fight... I'd probably like to know how to use a gun. Oh, look, it's a very, that's a very long stretch. And I also don't want to get, I don't want to be in the habit of generalizing people. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are some people that will purely uh, buy into the hot topics at the yep. time. I don't want to generalize them as a, as, as a group of people because I believe that's something that I believe uh, social media does do, mm -hmm. which is, makes it very easy to, to say that there's a group that... The, to group people together, yeah. yet it's almost impossible to physically... I think we're sitting in our bubble. Mm -hmm. We see a bubble pop up. Yeah. Right? When that bubble goes away, another bubble pops up, and we just say, well, that they're the same people. And I think the problem is, too, when it does come to things like social media and the bubbles that you're in, the algorithms know what they're doing. So someone who's got a, uh, a lean towards a certain subject, their algorithm then feeds them the next subject that they know would, sure. they would naturally gravitate yeah. towards. Whereas someone who doesn't lean into the first subject may not even see that at all. They exactly. might be, they'll be seeing something completely Elon different. tweeted, he said, your Twitter feed is being algorized. Here's one thing you can do to help. Okay. Go to your settings and change it to uh, chrono... Uh, uh, like to order your stuff by time. Yeah, chronological order. Chronological order. Yeah. And it's, I did it. Mm -hmm. It's a different thing. Yeah, right. So when I used to jump on it all the time, it would show me the same stuff. But now I'm getting all this. I'm like, who's this? I've never seen this person mm. before. Yeah, so that, that was really interesting. So yeah, so, some of that stuff happens, but I don't want to fall into the trap of oh, generalizing yeah, yeah, all these people <laughs> just because they have the different different views to us. Yeah. And we're assuming that they're the same people. Yeah. Now, all, some all of them, too. I will say there's some people on my Facebook mm -hmm. that do that. Oh, exactly yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would love to run an experiment. Remember Coney? Remember yeah. Coney? Yeah. Let's if like what is so interesting social experiment to invent another Coney, mm -hmm. put it out there and see who jumps on it, mm. right? And then go, hey guys, Coney doesn't think this. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we already seen that though? In a where, way, where do we think was Coney real? No, a hundred percent not real, or was it real and then no one cared about, or it was a story that was fifteen years old? Or I believe that it wasn't real. Can you have a look? Can, can you can we just? Can we check if Coney... Like yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm just not used to um, searching on Apple. <laughs> was Coney real? <laughs> was... Uh, Try to re replace it with... Was Kobe really uh, at Magic's first game? <laughs> was Coney real? Yeah, right. Uh, Joseph Coney, likely born 1961, is a Ugandan militant who founded the Lord's Resistance Army, LRA, a Christian fundamentalist organisation designated as a terrorist group by United Nations peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. The European Union and various other. Uh, I want to speak about the UN. Shortly what as well. is the real story? Uh, since Monday, more than twenty-one million people have viewed the film. With its slick Hollywood production values, the film has been an almost instant viral success. I'm just trying to see if it's real. About the charity's funding. Oh no! So okay, so it appears that it was a real story, but mm -hmm. it's just 
why the message was put out there. Yeah, it was yeah. to sell tickets to a show. Yeah, it's like the fire festival. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I would love, like, if you think about it, how cool would it be? Because I'm sure that those that 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 the minority of people that fall for everything would fall for that. Yeah, yeah. No. I and do you with. think it would be a wake up call? Do you think it would say, okay, if um, Pony, our version of Coney, mm. when you illustrate to them, hey. By the way, we made we fabricated all of this. Mm-hmm. Like, do you know who we need that? Yeah. <clears throat> Sasha Baron Cohen needs to do an, another one that's not left leaning. Yeah, he just needs to come out and re highlight the madness. But you know, the problem is we've had this many wake up calls in recent history, and I'm not just talking about the last three years. I'm talking about even prior to that. But the 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 machine moves so quickly to it the does. next thing that people forget about it. Yeah, like. Let's talk about some wake-up calls. Uh, Donald Trump, Russia collusion story, has been proven to be a hoax that was created by Hillary Clinton's campaign lawyers. The, the lawyer has been indicted. Like, the dude's probably going to prison. Mm. He'll prison. E- everyone was convinced. Not everyone, but a, yeah. lo- a large percentage of people, even, and, and this is probably what gets me to, and um, the, the Tinderbox events episode was about something similar. So many people in Australia are engaged in these subjects which don't affect them. So the Trump election thing, a lot of Australians, we did, engaged in it when it doesn't actually really affect us. The, the Roe v. Wade thing, a lot of Australians uh, were invested in it. When Australia's actually gone the polar opposite way, like when I did research on it, uh, Australia has legalised it. It's, in, it's legal in every state now. So it's like we, we got this engagement from it with, when it doesn't actually affect us. Yeah. At all, right? But, like, this is an example of we should have learned from that. So we should go, okay, that's been proven to have been a hoax. The Hunter Biden laptop story, everyone was told, was Russian propaganda. It's real. So these are all these wake-up calls that we should be having, but the media juggernaut put, puts out a Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard, and we go, we take one look at a, at a chick shitting on the bed, and we've forgotten about him. We've gone straight back to sleep. But I will say, though... That I think, in in my group of friends, mm-hmm. some people have changed. Some people have seen it. Yeah. So I'm again, I'm not generalising and saying that we don't learn. Mm. It's just a whole bunch of new people hitting the market that haven't yeah, no, haven't learned yet. Point. The the result that we don't know yet, which we can't speculate. Thank you. Congratulations again to. <laughs> uh, that'll be a big indicator to see whether or not people have changed yeah have you like d- significantly changed have you done the ask around to what people vote on because again when i first see people in the street i ask them who they voted for because some people have done the pre-polling i haven't because apart from speaking about it on the largest platform i've got i still subscribe to the thing of you shouldn't talk about politics yeah. when like when you i thought it was you only you exclusively talk about politics religion vaccines and bitcoin yeah um <laughs> Yeah, so and I, how many I, genders there are. I still, I still try to err uh, towards not talking about it. Um, pussy. <laughs> hey, bro, it's got nothing to do with being a pussy. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. probably got everything to do with maybe being a seven out of ten on the over aggressive scale, yeah. <laughs> according to uh, Andrew Human's podcast. Um, one thing I do want to uh, briefly speak about, which is super relevant because it happens in the next ten days or so, and will happen directly post mm. the election, is uh, Our election our election yep. is the uh what's it called it's like the world health summit i believe right let me bring it up here uh so this is something that's super important because one thing that i i i will say and i think everyone will tend to agree media and politicians have been real quiet on the covid front for the past month real quiet yeah ain't talking about it at all even though 2022 in australia is so far our most deadly year of the pandemic and it's only may yeah by a huge margin by a huge margin right we've got astronomical daily cases we've got way higher daily deaths than what we previously did and yeah more people have died so far in 2022 than any other year in the pandemic and consistently high i'd say like it's not that i mean we've had a peak high which is a big spike but this death rate that we've got now is daily yeah. hovering in this big meaty section of the yeah. uh, of the graph, and it's going 
the wrong way. Yeah. Now, for whatever reason that is, it still doesn't change the fact that our governments and the media have stopped talking about it. For sure. For the last I'd month. Agree with that. We still hear things here and there because they want to still keep it in front of us. But as far as like going back 12 months and having someone stand up and go, yeah, we've had one case, so we're locking down for a month. Yeah. We, we don't see that. I anymore. haven't seen the red germ displayed on the back yeah, of, yeah. You know, of, of a daily show. Dun, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, what scares me a little bit is uh, from May 22 to May 28 the, is the next World Health Assembly, which will take place in Geneva. And the member countries, of which Australia is a member, are going to be voting on amendments to the international health orders. So the vote is to make the World Health Organization's international health regulations mandatory on member nations. So that key word that we love, mandate, mm. mandatory. If the vote is successful, Australia will then need to ratify the new arrangement by way of passing legislation through federal parliament, handing power over Australia to the WHO in the event of a pandemic. No, it's never going to get passed. Now, it will be really interesting to see what the makeup of parliament is after the weekend because I'm based on like past behavior is a pretty good indicator of future behavior. Both liberal and labor supported every COVID measure over the past two years. Uh, on one side. That's right. Like, no, no, as in when the WHO was saying all this bad stuff, yep. they did all the bad stuff. That's when they right. said, okay, stop the bad stuff, they didn't stop. Yeah. So that's even worse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and does he say here, so the Liberals have already expressed support. It is most likely um, that like Liberal, Nationals and AOP will wave these measures through if, it, if they do have uh, the control. Now, measures specifically provided for in the regulations include lockdowns, hard borders around quarantine zones, vaccine passports, mandatory check-in and contact tracing, mandatory health tests, mandatory removal and quarantine, even worse, compulsory vaccination is part of the international health regulations and may now be forced on all Australians if this vote succeeds. What source is that? Where's that from? Uh, so this is from Malcolm Roberts from One Nation, posted up about this. Okay. Um, he's been speaking about it a lot over previous weeks. Because that's crazy. Yeah. Why would you give up any sovereignty? Like, like national sovereignty. That's crazy. So that's the question, right? And to a degree, we've not... We haven't, up until now, we haven't really given up national sovereignty, but we have given over control in regards to, oh, sorry. That is sovereignty. Not, well, yeah, not over, not giving over control. Our governments use the World Health Organization as the excuse going there. The experts, we're going to do what they said to do all of these things they've done in the last two years. And when you consider the fact that all of those things that are in there, for, for, for what it's worth, we were told during the pandemic, if we did lockdowns and if we all got vaccinated, this would go away. That has not occurred, which is proof in the pudding by the fact that we are currently experiencing our worst year of the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? So if those are the things that are on the list of things to do, we already know they don't work. And yet it appears that this vote will take place later on this month, yeah. which I'll be following very, very closely. Please do. I would say that it appears obvious to us red pillars, hmm. but if but blue pillars would say it's very obvious that we should do. That's right. Yeah. And the problem is, this is one of the things which has gotten worse during the pandemic is we have been systematically manipulated into believing that we should agree to hand over some of our rights for a perceived level of safety. Yeah, don't think it's worse. It happens, happened before. Of course. But it's get. I, I believe it is getting worse. I know, but you have this propensity to believe that everything's getting worse. That's This is one I of the things I'm trying to address. I believe this attitude is getting worse. No, because I would say the Cronulla riots was an example of where that radicalisation was way worse than what we had this time. I disagree, because the whole country wasn't involved in it. 90% of the population didn't go to Cronulla and, no. and bash the 10%. No, they wanted to. It was. It, I disagree. Uh, Did you want to? No, I didn't want to, but I received the text. So, like, yeah, that, just because you received the text doesn't mean no, no, no. But, but that I would say that was as polarizing as this moment. That's what, don't get caught in the trap 
of just saying shit is worse now because you've forgotten how bad stuff was when it was in the past. I agree that that was bad. Yeah. But I don't think that as many people were mobilised back then as what they are now about this. And the issue that I've got is that, like, when it comes to perceived safety, we've seen the safety doesn't exist. So think back to when, like, the vaccine rollout started. Everything was about talking about herd immunity. Herd immunity was a sales pitch. Herd immunity, herd immunity, herd immunity. Yeah. And it was like 65%, 75%. Then 80% was the number. They set the number at 80%. And then I'm like, oh, it's, maybe it's 90%. And then like, I was just talking to Amanda about this the other day. And we'll, we'll talk about how in Queensland in December, at the 90%, like when we hit the 90%, they then banned the unvaxxed from doing stuff. Yeah. And, right? and then it got worse. Yeah. Um, so again, for a perceived uh, safety benefit, people allowed rights to be taken away from them. And maybe maybe this is has been a wake-up call for a lot of people. I hope it has. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like you said, I've seen it reflected in certain parts of my network that yeah. it has been a wake-up call. But I also know that we're just one more Amber Heard shitting on the bed story away from people forgetting about it and then blindly just walking straight into the next thing. And like that whole frog in the boiling water thing, waking up eventually, but realizing, oh shit, I, maybe I should have done something different. Yeah, and I think I think the lesson in that is whatever you see, ask why. Mm. What's and research both sides. Yeah, yeah. That that that's the only the only answer is to to think critically. Yeah. Yeah, Which... that and and the one thing I want to say because I, you and someone else in our group, mm -hmm. I think, are being uh, too fearful of what's going to happen, and what I would say as a as a um, what I would say as a thing to alleviate your 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 uh, um, fears fears. Is that we've always been through this stuff. It's just another one. Yes, this was a major one mm. for sure, but there have been other major ones. Mm -hmm. And you know, you sent me that video that I watched that that uh, from that mm. that political thing. Mm -hmm. That was the eighties. You know, mm -hmm. and they and they had some issues there as well. Yes, some of it ties into what happens today. But I'm not worried about your kids. Mm. Your kids are going to sort it out. They always have. There has. There's only been really one. Well one that we know of downfall of civilization, which was, you know, when we went into the dark ages, mm. the argument being, uh, I think Rome got too big and, mm -hmm. and, uh, some, some, uh, some, the, the economy didn't work and the political party didn't work and mm -hmm. they collapsed into, into dark ages. Mm -hmm. We got out of it and became more prosperous than ever. Mm -hmm. So I don't hold any of that fear for the future mm -hmm. because by by that rationale, since the fifteen hundreds, life's only got better. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you on that. And like to, I guess to try to put it out there, where I come from, I don't think comes from fear. I come, I think it comes from seeing the future, seeing what it's moving towards, and trying to do something about it. And I guess like when we when we talk about when we first started speaking about the COVID stuff on the pod, you go back to listen to like episode 15, 16, those early ones, and we were really talking about it. We called a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the Absolutely. negative stuff, we called it before it ended up happening. We've been vindicated on just about everything that we've said. Yeah. And and look, obviously, we haven't got absolutely everything right to the T, but we got a fuckload more right than what people thought we would at the beginning. We yeah. lost so much of our viewership from starting to talk about that subject. Yeah. And the concern, and this is not fear, this is like, this is just realistic, this is reality, is when, when these big things happen... Like we often talk about how um, our our big moment, our big wake up moment was like GFC when no no that wasn't mine. Well, yours was September 11. Yeah, I was probably slightly too young. Yeah, at the time. Looking back on it now, it's obviously it's a big wake up call for me. But at the time, I don't think it was. I was as... radicalized. Yeah. Okay. So at the time for me, uh, September 11 was a big deal, but I didn't understand it enough yep. to, to really learn from it. For me, GFC was the first thing where I went, hang on a minute, these banks and people doing the wrong thing caused a like Western world global collapse that affected millions of little people. Financial collapse. Financial collapse. And no one went to jail. Yeah. Like, that was a big thing for me. There's actually a big story on that happening at the moment, which, no, well, it's a big story if you're in one of the nations that's affected. But 
uh, have you heard about the, there's like 70 uh, third world countries that this year are predicted to have their economies collapse completely and under like debt pressures? Have you heard about this at all? Uh, I know that it's been happening <clears throat> forever. So the, uh, Michael Saylor talked about it. Right. He's like 90, 99% of, of um, no, 95% of all currencies will eventually collapse. Mm -hmm. And it's only the major ones that really survive. Yeah. So if, it, and we've spoken about how bad the US one is yeah. and the one, the two big dogs. Yeah. So you so if they're the bitcoins, what are the shit coins? Yeah, yeah. I know. So it's obvious to me. It's not surprising at all. And, yeah. But but what I would say is it doesn't matter no, because it's... it's just replaced by another system. That's all that happens. It's it the financial system in in many ways is purely an administrative event. Yeah, I <clears throat> where it's where it gets tricky is I think it. It does, man. And this is maybe somewhere where... Like, I understand what you're saying in that... Greece ran out of money? Yeah. Greece is still Greece. Yeah, but a lot of people suffered along the way. Yeah, it was, it was rough. But some people some people prospered. Some people some people suffer in the best economic times. Yeah, I, I, I agree with yeah. that. It doesn't make it a good thing, though. It doesn't make I, it a good thing, but it's a, it's, it's a natural part of a free-flowing economy. I don't some think work it is natural, day. though. It is absolutely natural. I, yeah, see, I don't, I don't think that it is. And well, sorry. I think that there are a lot of things about it that are far more unnatural than uh, natural. Corruption is natural. <sighs> Doesn't make and, it the right thing. Though. I'm not saying it's right. Yeah, but it's natural. Mm. And, well, and it's I'm just, saying when you have corruption in, involved in in any system, yeah, uh, eventually the truth's going to come out at some stage. Yeah, and therefore things are going to fail. Uh, that is, to me, that is uh, as as obvious. That's an obvious human nature so here's so here's my thing so with if you look at australia for example oh, um, we are like so yesterday morning on my way to work i drove past a servo that had unleaded fuel at a dollar 77 and on the way back i drove past the same servo and and this was like on my i was on my way up at 11 30 and on my way down at five and the price has gone up to two dollars 14. It's on the same day. Yeah. Now, we know how, you know, we've been talking supply chain crises for however long, because uh, this was happening pre, you know, 2021. It was already yeah. happening way back then. Uh, you had, you've now got the, the cost of fuel going up. It's only the cost of all the, like, everything's going Putin's up. Putin's price hike. Yeah, they, they can call it Putin's price hike, which is what it's being blamed on, but it's, it's not that. No. Right? We know it's not And that. it also say that, Putin hasn't placed sanctions on his fuel. He's happy to sell it. Yeah, well, I mean, there was, a, there was an interesting story it's about that. It's just that, that Biden doesn't want to, people to buy it. But that's the thing. It's, it's, it's all of these nations. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. All these nations that did the same thing during the COVID pandemic are all involved in the same fuckery. Yeah, for sure. Big story out of Canada recently was... Dude, I'm, that is not stopping. That is going crazy. Uh, it's not, actually. It's... Yeah, I mean, like, it might be shown up yeah. there, but, yeah. Um, so, I can't remember exactly what product it was, but there's a product that Canada sources a lot of from Russia. And a lot of these products are, like, prepaid in, like, six months in advance. And Canada's recently put a 35% tariff on these particular products. Right. But the thing is, because the companies had already ordered the product six months prior, they've, already, they've actually ordered and prepaid. So Russia's already got their money. Mm. So when those products came over, they, the, um, not the supplier, but the middleman, to get the stuff off the boats had to front the 35% tariff. So in other words, by claiming that you're trying to punish Russia, which you shouldn't be punishing Russia anyway. Like it's not the Russian people. Not the people, which is what essentially economic sanctions do. Yep. They, uh, the people suffer. All they've done is put an additional tax on their own people and put more supply chain pressure Absolutely. in their own countries. And that's why I'm saying a lot of the stuff ain't natural. And like, I guess you can you can say, oh, corruption's natural. But like the the economic pressures that we're experiencing now, they're not natural. They're manufactured. Oh, they, they're manufactured, but the, the, um, the <clears throat> willingness to manufacture them is natural. Mm. Like, it, it's corruptible. Yeah. 
that's well, why Bitcoin's not. Yeah, for right, sure. So, okay, so so that that was that was his whole point. That was Satoshi Nakamoto's entire point. Yep. Is if it's corruptible, it will be corrupted. Yeah. And I I have, and again, I don't know if it's a if it's a Bitcoin uh, ideology that I'm bringing across. Mm -hmm. All this I, this stuff is happening all day, every day, all around the world. Mm where something is being upset, where a market is being upset because it's being fo uh, uh, fettled with, and it's just going to happen, and it's just a fact of life. Mm. You know, there's nothing you can do against that besides move some of your assets to, to, to crypto. Um, <clears throat> Which now's a good time to do. Not Luna. Well, I'm waiting to see what the trend... I'm waiting to see it, whether this trend reverses. Mm -hmm. I'm, I want to see which direction it's going to go. Yeah. Um, but anyway... To, to, to the point, like, economic fuckery mm. has happened ever since the ability to economically fuck around has been around. Yeah. It's been around forever. Mm -hmm. It will be around forever. There is no utopian world where, that, where that's going to go away mm -hmm. because we are flawed people. Mm. We're going we're gonna to do it. Yeah. And I would say to anyone out there, if you're in a position where you could massively benefit you'd probably do it too, mm -hmm. you know? And if you're saying no, they haven't offered you enough yet. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Right? Yeah. Right? That everyone's got a number. and um, Which is why I'm, I'm sitting here hoping that we're a court where this is playing on Monday with a hung parliament. Yeah. Because, yeah, like we've said before, I mean, you look at... You need more voices in there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the only thing that stands between, like, you, like the people and corruption is having enough people with oversight of it to stop things from happening that, yeah. that are bad decisions. I mean, Victoria is the best example. Like, largest, like they had the most control of their um, state parliament. They rammed through every single measure they wanted to. Their people experienced the longest lockdown in the world. They've got the highest amount of debt that came out of it, and they've got the worst COVID outcomes. Like, that's an example. And economic outcomes. The debt level, yeah. highest debt level. So in every conceivable metric... They, 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 they went the worst. They went the worst. Out of every state in Australia. And I think that's, I think that's a <clears throat> good thing to highlight. I think not a lot of people would. Yeah. And do you know what would have really... Because again, the problem is the, the, the sales pitch is this typical leftist sales pitch. Oh, well... Imagine if they didn't do these things. Yeah. Like, we don't know millions of people would have died. Like, they, they, they pull yeah. that shit all the time. It's like, no, 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 no. Because other places didn't do those things. Sweden has been quietly not in the news much lately, where um, I think the World Health Organization actually finally came out and admitted Sweden's figures overall for COVID, both from an um, overall death rate and especially an economic rate, have far exceeded that of other countries in Europe. Well, remember we said this a while ago. Yeah. I said that because the Sweden's numbers were worse than ours, but I said Early. there will be a... Well, still, uh, up until this point, I'd argue we could see what the numbers are now. Mm. Their numbers are still up, but I said what, what will their... You have to count their numbers after this is all done as yeah. a full acute number. As, and especially of like all-cause mortality yeah. as well. Yeah, but we've even uh, talking about that Sweden thing. You know, the Israel, the the health minister from Israel says he wishes he never closed down schools. Yeah. I watched because I've been obsessed with Barstool Sports and Dave Portnoy at the moment. I watched his Portnoy and uh, interview with or Dave Portnoy interviewing Donald Trump when he was still in power. Right. And one of the things this is at the height of the when the pandemic was first starting. He's like, we've got to open schools. We've got to open schools. We've got yeah. to open schools. Now, in retrospect, that's right. We had to have schools open, and everyone admits that. Mm -hmm. Like the numbers bad, right? Oh, I'm not looking at... I remember Sweden at the time it had like 17,000 deaths or something, which was obviously significantly more than Australia. I'm just going through Australia's COVID live stats now and I just noticed that there's a new section called winter doses. That's what they're calling them now. That's the fourth shot. Uh, I think Canada is at five now. I heard... I, I did see someone was... Uh, someone was up to the fifth. But if you've got... Get, pull the Swedish numbers up. Well, the deaths so far, we've got um, 7,271 deaths all up. For the whole pandemic. Um... And again, I still don't think the numbers stack up until it's all over. Yeah, and again, looking at all-cause mortality. Yeah, because, yeah. like, for a start, I mean... Well, can you look at the Swedish numbers? Uh, yeah, but I, I thought we were moving on. I just want to see, because that we could have passed that tipping point now. Like, they could be on this big downward trajectory, you know? And yeah, I get you. And the fact that there's that article that came out and said that they, they have done it right. 
and they did nothing. They closed no businesses. They clo- they they um the they treated went, their people like adults. Yeah. They said these are the things that the World Health Organization is saying to do. Uh, do those things if you want. Yeah. Do what you want to do. Be what you want to be. Yeah. So as far as the there's no song that says do what the government says, <laughs> even if it makes no sense. There is in China. Their seven day death average is 10. And I'm pretty sure our seven day death average is five. No, it can't be. We're doing more than five in Queensland. Uh, let me have a look. There's no way. It's got to be investigation. Um, Deaths Australia. Why is this now not working? It's conspiracy, mate. I was, I was talking to dad yesterday about. Something to do with the election. Can't remember exactly what it was, but the, the conversation took a bit of a turn and then the call cut out. And I was like, I called them back. And I was like, the, they're on to us, man. Yeah, mate, they're listening to us. Um, on a, our seven day average is nine. So we're, we're similar as far as seven day averages go at the moment. But as a proportion, what's the population number? Uh, Have they got more or less people than us? they've got i think they've got less people but then you're talking like um size of the country and stuff so they've only got 10 million people yeah okay so their numbers is worse now yeah but again like you were saying what is going to be important is the washout of all-cause mortality because as we highlighted recently australia's all-cause mortality has been rapidly increasing yeah. ever since october last year to the point that in january our deaths from all like excess deaths was up 25 percent just in that month yeah and that's based on the average between i think it's 2014 and 2019 prior to so our all cause mortality is increasing not just covid deaths i was going i was watching <coughs> jordan peterson on pvd podcast yeah and the question was raised like do you think the western countries have done it well and he was talking mainly about canada mm. and jordan peterson goes we have no idea how bad like we don't know if the measures that we've put in place are better or worse than the disease yeah we, we don't have a will he's like supply chain could end up being worse mm-hmm. uh um the financial like inflation could end up being worse inflation could kill more people than what yeah agree what the virus is. and yeah. we don't we don't know and anyways because we don't measure it we'll never know mm. and there's probably uh there's probably you know and you shouldn't will that upon a, a government to decide whether mm. that's the right thing or, or, or wrong thing to do so that greater good argument what I think we really need to think about is uh, who's greater good. Yeah. Here, here's a point I'll make on that. Um, and then can we finish up? Because I've got some. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll finish up just shortly after this. But the. So this, this vote that's coming up to hand over power to a World Health Organization in the event of the next pandemic. Yeah, who sucked, by the way, who got, who got it wrong. But anyway. Yeah, so they got a lot of stuff wrong, including the fact that they fucking defended China the whole way through. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. Trump, well, Trump was still calling it, and China brought this disease. Yeah. Yeah. And so we should, just keep, yeah. keep reminding yeah. uh, But we, we've been told countless times the last two years that this is a once in a 100 year pandemic. They keep re, um, relating back to the Spanish flu. So, in, we, so we've experienced a once in a 100 year pandemic, and now we're going to vote that for the next pandemic, we're going to hand over the keys to the World Health Organization. Now, to, to juxtapose that against another crisis that we've got going on we've got the climate crisis right we've got the climate crisis it's it's going to kill everyone because of climate change and we've got a net zero by 2050 policy so why if we're treating the climate crisis like it can be net zero by 2050 why can't we treat the 100 once in a 100 year pandemic like let's have net zero uh covid related fatalities by 2050 why do we have to go oh fuck like quickly hand the keys to the who straight away it doesn't seem Proportionate. Uh, the the response saying. to it does not seem proportionate. If we've been saying this has only happened once every hundred years, well, we've already gone through the worst of it. Why are we looking at? No, nah, I, look. I can see playing devil's advocate. I can see them saying, "Well, let's just get the experts to do it. They can solely work on that." Like what Bill Gates came out and said that he wants eighty billion dollars a year to fund a. Uh, a crew of people that just handle pandemics. The Germ Squad. I don't know. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah it's the called the Germ Squad. That's not a joke. It's called yeah. a. That's called the Germ Squad, and you know, it's debatable whether they'll be making or curing the vaccine, uh, the the the, uh, uh, the, the viruses, diseases, the yeah, viruses. Yeah. But maybe you could say, hey, let's just outsource 
that to someone else because we don't have to worry about it for every hundred years. That yeah, could be and, and I'm happy to um, to take the advice of experts as long as we're taking the advice of experts and we're not saying uh, only these experts, not these other ones that have yeah. a conflicting opinion. Um, did you see that clip of Bill Gates that went viral this week about him talking about he's being interviewed by I think Anderson Cooper from one of the um, I don't I think it might be NBC or whatever. Yeah one of the left-leaning news programs in America, because he's just recently gotten COVID for the second time. So the, the, the vax the guy, The guy who made the vax just can't even stay safe from yeah. it. Um, and Couldn't keep viruses on, out, of his, uh, on, out of his program either. Yeah. So he was talking about how he's experiencing mild symptoms because of the vaccine and because he had uh, access to Paxlovid. So the no agenda guys were just like, well, this is just obviously a Pfizer out for Paxlovid. Yep. But anyway, uh, but... He was saying, like, Anderson Cooper asked him the question about, like, oh, so, you know, we know that the that you have been trying so hard to get, you know, vaccines out to people and, you know, all these people are coming out. Like, how do you deal with these conspiracy theorists who think that you're just in this for profits yeah, and blah, blah, blah? And he's, like, Bill Gates literally goes, yeah, so, you know, we've, we've given... Yeah billions of dollars for vaccine research. We, we've saved millions of people... And, you know, so I guess for some people, it just, it makes it easier to just have someone to blame. Who didn't deny it. Well, no, he, he sort of did. Well, he, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. If you think, if you just say what he said again, we've given billions yeah. to blah, 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 out of the trillions that you've made. Away. No, no, but what he says is he goes, we've given billions of dollars. So to say that um, I'm trying to make profit out of this is a conspiracy theory. So the end of the clip, he's, he basically says... If you're saying I'm doing this for profit, you're a conspiracy theorist. No, but what I'm saying is hidden in that he never lied. He said, he didn't say, well, no, I didn't make any money out of it. I didn't do it for profit. He didn't say that. What he yeah. said was, I've given billions. I've made more. Yeah. I've given billions. I've saved millions of lives. Mm. And, you know, anyone thinks that I only do it for profit is a conspiracy theorist. Well, no, you. Yeah. It wasn't the only reason why you did it. And they've juxtaposed it against that clip of him from like a year ago, where he's being interviewed, and he said he got a twenty x return on investment on his vaccine business. Yeah, he said that multiple times because uh, yeah. he did it on a TED talk as well, where he said the same thing. He yeah. got a great return out of it. Mm. Mm. And on that note, yeah, let's leave it there. Thanks very much for joining us, guys. Stay safe, and we'll see what happens next with whatever new government is currently taking care of us. And congratulations to, to government. Laters. Thank <laughs> you.